Greetings and best wishes from uh, Vancouver, Canada. Peace up on every one of you, wherever you are. This is uh, the continuation of the series of lectures we planned for our cyber patient. In the first lecture, we introduced to you cyber patient and we talked about the um, educational philosophy behind cyber patient. In the second lecture, we talked about the uh, cyber patient uh, design, um, technical requirements, and we also gave you some tips on how to navigate um, around cyber patient. Today, we're gonna talk about how to integrate cyber patient into your curriculum. So by the end of this um, lecture, we should have a common consensus about the curriculum concept and then you should be able to learn how to integrate cyber patient into your university or medical school curriculum as a content or as an assessment tool. And we are gonna talk in the end a little bit about the benefits that cyber patient can give to your students, to faculty, to um, your institution and hospitals and the society as a whole. But before we start, I thought it is very important for us to have a common consensus on uh, the curriculum concept because people may understand curriculum in different ways. There is a huge discrepancy uh, about the understanding of the concept of curriculum amongst um, educators around the world. So um, to do that, I thought it's important to go um, to, uh, sorry, it's, uh, yeah. In order to do that, um, we should understand that by definitions, people think that, um, some people think that curriculum is a body of knowledge. Some people think that curriculum is a menu of opportunities. Some people think that curriculum is a content of the course on syllabus. Some people think that curriculum is a guide for education process. And some people think that curriculum can be also only the program of a medical school. In order to understand and have a common consensus uh, amongst ourselves on what curriculum is, um, I want to go to the uh, word curriculum, what it means. So the word curriculum is coming from the Latin verb to cur, which means to run. So in the ancient um, Romans, when they were doing the competition of the char chariots, the chariots, when they go around the stadium in complete a circle, they called it a curriculum. So they do two circles, they called it two curriculum. So the word curriculum is actually coming for these, from these competition, that means closing a circuit, running to close a circuit. But first time curriculum, uh, was used in the concept of education by John Franklin Bobbitt in 1918. Before Bobbitt, um, the education was faculty centered. So the teacher had all the power on what to teach, how to teach, where to teach, whether they assess a, a student uh, on their learning or not. So what Bobbitt said is that this cannot be called education. Education has to be all around the learning objectives. Before a teacher goes into a classroom and teach, the teacher should define what the goals of that teaching process is. And 
what is the process to reach that goal? And then how we're gonna assess whether the students learn something or they did not learn anything. So Bobbitt actually made a revolution in medical, in education as a whole. By this revolution, he made uh, or asked us at least the teachers to be prepared before they go to classroom and they should have a clear idea on what the goals and objectives are in how they deliver that in in how they assess the student whether they learn anything or not and also to assess the whole process of education to go to to take those information and go back to the goals and objectives and improve your um, educational process so that's why he compare it to a curriculum, call it a curriculum because it's a circle that goes back to improve and again and again and again. So um, the idea of Bobbitt at that time was not very popular. People did not like him because he took the power out of the hands of the teachers and gave it to the educational process, to the, to the objectives, goals, and to the students. So therefore, um, it took about 38, one years, um, for people to recognize uh, Bobbitt's theory of curriculum and Taylor in 1949 start talking about uh, um, curriculum theory of Bobbitt. And only in 1983, um, it become a norm in the educational circles so that every education has to be um, curriculum based. So, um, in relation to that, I, I do not like to talk about the uh, curriculum ideas in uh, concepts because it's another lecture, another time. But if there is a common consensus that a modern curriculum should have a needs assessment, it should have learning objectives, it should have the content or syllabus, it should have the method of delivery, and this method of delivery should be task analyzed uh, on learners, teachers, and environment, which means we, that the teacher should explain what the learner should do to reach the learning objective, what the teacher should do to reach the learning objective, and what kind of environment there should be to reach the learning in objectives. And, and in the end, how the student should be assessed to see if the student reached the learning objectives. So you can see that everything is around the learning objective. And in the end, the education process should be evaluated to come back and close the loop and to see whether, whether we are gonna change the learning objective or we're gonna add to it or subtract or modify it. So these are the components of a modern <clears throat> curriculum. Let's see now if cyber patient meets these uh, these requirements, these components. As we know already that cyber patient is based on, on a needs assessment, based on a gap between theory and practice of medicine, and it fills that gap. Cyber patient has a specific learning objectives uh, in each uh, part of it. E each level of cyber patient has a specific learning objectives. In each case in cyber patient has a specific learning objectives. Cyber patient has a constant a syllabus, which is the cases itself. Then we have a methods of delivery, which is an asynchronous methods of delivery. And then the, the, the learners, teachers in environment um, is well described how to reach those learning objectives. And cyber patient constantly and consistently evaluates uh, the students and, and gave feedback in the end. And we are evaluating the whole process um, in different universities right now, how cyber patient work, what didn't work, and how we can go back, close the loop, and change our learning objectives or make cyber patient um, as a better uh, curriculum um, module. So with respect to these requirements, um, cyber patient is a curriculum. So what it doesn't matter actually if this components are in a 
um, small bit of a knowledge um, or practicum uh, such as uh, intubation. So you can have all these components in a few pages of a curriculum for one small little thing, and, and that will be intubation or a spinal cord puncture or something. But should have all these components. As, so, as long as it has the components, then it would be called a curriculum. Or it could be curriculum of a department of medicine, department of surgery, which is much bigger. But that curriculum has more contents and syllabuses and more learning objectives. But they should, if they have these components, this is the curriculum. Or even medical school uh, curriculum should have all these components. So coming back to cyber patient, cyber patient has all these components and could be called a curriculum. However, uh, as a curriculum, politically, it's very difficult for universities to integrate cyber patient into their system. Um, it would take time, perhaps research and uh, proof, uh, proofs, um, uh, scientific evidences uh, for universities to say, yes, this is a curriculum, let's integrate it. But up until then, we can use cyber patient in different ways, or we can integrate cyber patient into your present existing curricula into different ways. The first way we can do it is by um, using cyber patient as a content, as a syllabus. Sorry to interrupt, uh, Dr. Kareem. We just got a comment from one of our attendees. Would it be possible if you could just close the colors tab that is right on your screen? It's the little, um, you know, where all the colored pens are? Oh, right. oh I'm, I'm so sorry. Just one second. I, I apologize. I will, I'll do that. Yeah. Um, uh, it's just a little X right there. Perfect. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you. That's, that's my fault. That's fine. Uh, thanks for the comment. Is that okay now? Everybody can see it? Looks great. Good. Now, um, you can integrate um, cyber patient as a content to your PBL and CBL group discussions. Um, in the lower level. So the ultimate goal uh, for PBL and CBL is to improve uh, problem solving uh, skills of students. And um, we have actually the, uh, uh, the difference between, uh, uh, between the PBL and CBL, perhaps you all know, um, I just outlined a, a brief moments here, uh, PBL, um, is um, based on a clinical cases that are paper or online sometime. And the role of the facilitator is um, passive. Well, they, they cannot guide students, students has to guide themselves. And the method um, of the question is open inquiry. Where in, uh, uh, in um, our uh, CBL, uh, clinical cases are uh, presented to students by standardized patients or videotapes. Um, mainly, and uh, the role of the facilitator is active, or uh, and the method is um, uh, guiding inquiry. So we can actually use um, uh, the uh, cyber patient level three, guided by teachers, presented by teachers, uh, to these discussion uh, groups, whether it is a PBL or a CBL discussion group. Cyber patient can also be uh, used as a content in pre clerkship uh, clinical scales and also for the clerkship clinical rotations. For the pre clerkship clinical scales, uh, what, if your curriculum is uh, vertical or horizontal, it doesn't matter. You can use uh, uh, history taking, physical examination, um, and differentials. You can teach all these in with the cyber patient level one and two. So you can integrate cyber patient level one and two in your pre-clerkship um, uh, program as clinical skills uh, uh, supporter. Now, um, you can also integrate the cyber patient uh, at level three into your clerkship. So the main objective for the clerkship is to um, have clinical skills related to specific pathologies, but the main other issue is clinical decision-making. So to, you can 
teach the students clinical decision making with cyber patient um, interpretation such as interpretation of um, investigation design and performance management strategies design and perform therapeutic strategies um, exercise clinical judgment uh, recognize immediate life-threatening conditions uh, provide initial therapy for, for, for patient, pre and post operative care management, evaluation of the health problem uh, institutions, and um, giving advances um, in, uh, uh, so, uh, giving recommendations to, student, uh, to, to the patients, and also um, consultations. But also there's one another important issue that, um, no curriculum or maybe little curriculum exists out there that would um, teach uh, in the scholarship uh, program rotations uh, how to utilize uh, the hospital resources. Um, I think cyber patient has the capacity to teach students um, how to use um, resources more efficiently at, for the patients to be less costly to the system. Cyber patient can also um, be used um, in the internship uh, program. So uh, the main goal of the internship program is to prepare and enable the graduate students to function independently in a supervised clinical settings. Now cyber patient level four would provide the opportunity for the students to practice their independence, to practice their um, uh, without even supervision at this time, uh, because it's in the uh, uh, cyberspace and it, you doesn't you do not harm a patient. So you can actually learn on your mistakes, so that when you are in the real internship program, uh, you have been through the cases, you have been through decision makings, you have made your mistakes, and you can just uh, uh, be a better intern. Uh, when it comes to uh, your program and your internship would be much better in a higher level. And also uh, in Canada, we are uh, using uh, CANMED competencies uh, for the internship, as you all know, um, in, in order to prepare them uh, and make them ready for clinical practice. Cyber patient um, uh, is, um, investigated at this time for OSCEs. Uh, in Jap our Japanese uh, partners are, are um, doing this research and soon it will be published. Next um, lecture, I'm gonna be talking about uh, a little bit about their uh, research program. But uh, the uh, next generation of cyber patient that will be coming soon uh, at least by the end of this year will be commercially available, uh, would have the, all the EPAs. So the interestable professional activities. So it would be, cyber patient would become a tool, not only for uh, assessment of uh, interestable professional activities, but also a place to train, uh, uh, you know, EPAs um, and uh, without any um, additional cost. So uh, the other way we can use uh, cyber patient in your curriculum is um, as an assessment tool. And to do that, I will uh, say that there are different ways you can use cyber patient for assessment. The first thing that comes to my mind is as a prerequisite. We know that there is uh, assignments, coursework um, uh, in every uh, curriculum and every uh, course that you teach, clinical or non-clinical. So by the end of uh, your course and cycle or examination, you have uh, the student has to hand certain assignments and coursework. So cyber patient could be used as one of those courseworks or one of those assignments. And also, um, uh, you, I, I know that we gave um, uh, students a patients or several patients to uh, write the a chart of a patient to uh, write the rationale behind their decisions. And that can be also used with cyber patient chart um, as paperless 
uh, seamless and uh, the, the, the faculties can assign them, students can do that, and electronically the, the teachers can uh, evaluate and assess those charts. So um, yes, if you use cyber patient um, and you will tell students that you have to achieve 80%, 70%, whatever you decide, uh, before you're gonna go to the end of this course or the end of this semester, uh, then I think it will be very useful for students and uh, cyber patient as an assess, as an additional uh, method uh, would support uh, your assessment. Aside from prerequisites, uh, I just wanted to <laughs> make sure you understand that I've been a student in my life. If you don't tell students that it's gonna be on your exam, they're not gonna study it. They would think the cyber patient is a game, they will play with it and that's all. But if they know that they have to reach 80%, 70% of that, then they are gonna go through the same cases of the cyber patient several times up until they achieve that requirement of the university or faculty, then they are gonna really learn something. So, uh, but I think the most uh, benefit cyber patient has or the most useful cyber patient would be in the formative assessment. Because uh, the, the end goal of the formative assessment is to understand the weaknesses of the student during the rotation and to understand how we are gonna affect the student to, to, uh, to give the true feedback to make uh, a, a better decision uh, and to complete the cycle or the rotation um, in a good way. So, um, so understanding the weakness and shortfall of the student and giving them the feedback is the main goal of the formative assessment. And with cyber patient, Actually, um, you can do that. In a normal situation, I have been a teacher for 50 years, and um, I can tell you that in a normal situation, in a rotation, um, I could do only one formative assessment, assessment because it's tough, it's time consuming, and if you, if you do one, you have, it has to be documented, and it ha then you have to talk to the students. And it, so it, it's, a, it's a whole process that is very time consuming and labor intensive for the faculty. So um, formative assessment, if it takes place, it can take place only once. And it's judged, uh, we judge that by other people talking about the student or by the uh, uh, diary that the student has and signed by different people, which is very subjective. However, with cyber patient integration, what you can do, you can actually do summative assessment every week or every day, and you can monitor your student, how they perform, where their shortfalls are, where their weaknesses are, and you can continuously talk to them and uh, without putting a lot of efforts in time, you know, just if you have one uh, office hours to two office hours in the end of your busy uh, surgery day or, or clinical day, uh, you can just go through a, a bunch of students and give them some feedbacks online and you don't have to even um, talk to them. So, it, so I think the, the, the value of cyber patient as a formative assessment is enormous and uh, will help the faculty enormously. So as a summative assessment, uh, can uh, cyber patient be used as a summative assessment? Perhaps uh, summative assessments are usually uh, not one thing. It's a, it's, um, it's a, a group of activities uh, that we, we assign different percentages uh, to it. For example, for the final exam, uh, you, you, you know, the, the package could consist of attendance of the students, uh, their coursework, uh, and then the MCQ or oral in the end. So cyber patient could easily be one of those components. You can put, say, say okay, 10% of your um, in point um, a summative assessment of cyber patient or 15 or 20%, it's up to you. But you could do that. And also um, the, um, Final, uh, you know, practical assessment uh, of students are usually done uh, by OSCEs. And uh, nowadays, we're talking about interestable professional activities uh, that 
that is very difficult to uh, achieve because again, it's very time consuming and manpower driven. So, but cyber patient APA actually could support the, uh, the OSCEs and, uh, and the EPAs very easily. Now, in the end, I would like to um, uh, talk to you a little bit about the cyber patient benefits. Cyber patient will have uh, direct benefits to the students. The students uh, will be uh, better, will have a better clinical skills, will have a better clinical decision making, will have um, uh, a lot of experience in different outcomes of different patients because you have a hospital, a virtual hospital with 12 wards and 120 patients in each ward readily available day and night for any student to do any kind of an examination and assessment and so on and, this, and make decisions uh, on those things. So, um, and then, um, and that's why it will have a freedom of practice to go wherever you want. It's a student center, so students can go as far as they can, as, as far as their ability allow them to go. So it built competencies before entering the clinical practice. That's very important. The students are very competent, or at least partially competent, when they go before they go to clinical practice, um, or or clinical, uh, uh, you know, not just practice, but but clinical rotations to learn. Um, it will improve the confidence of novice students. Many students have told us that they have been very confident or at least more confident than they've ever been after they um, uh, exercised clinical skills with cyber patient. It expedites the learning process. Of course, um, uh, you know, I'm a cardiac surgeon by training, so I'll, in order to um, operate on a in, in complete the course of evaluation of a um, cardiac patient, it needs at least need three months or, or, or two months or three months, the least. Sometimes it's more because you have to do all the investigations, you wait, you talk, you schedule people and so on and so forth. But, but with cyber patient, uh, a student can go within 20 minutes uh, through this whole exercise. And, and if, if he goes through that exercise over and over with many patients, it would um, expedite their uh, learning process uh, for sure. And it's, um, uh, they will practice documentation uh, competencies. Uh, one of the major lock is that um, in the hospitals, the students are not allowed to, particularly novice students, to uh, write anything in the chart of a patient. So if you don't practice how to document, how do you learn how to document? So here cyber patient will give you the opportunity with an with a electronic chart so that you can do actually rational, do make decisions, document your decisions and rationalize your decisions while you made it. And then um, it, in, in general, uh, it makes the educational process more efficient. For benefit for faculties are also very important. Um, the dream of every faculty member is to, uh, particularly faculty members with, uh, with clinical loads in, in surgery or emergency or any other things, uh, with clinical load, the dream is always to, uh, to deliver um, the practical education asynchronously, at least to provide the environment for students to, to learn uh, the initial steps of clinical decision making, the initial initial steps of clinical scales. So when they come to it, to the to the ward, um, they would not um, make you mad or upset or or, or anything. So and, and then the pressure is not on you so much because you you have to watch every step of the students to not make any harm to a patient or any wrong decisions. So the asynchronous delivery. Is um, is is uh, is is a heaven for a for a for a faculty member because he doesn't have to um, put any efforts to do that. Uh, and um, patient availability is another problem uh, for faculty always because um, a lot of times, in my experience, when the students are coming for a rotation, the patient might not be there. Uh, uh, the, the patients that are in the curriculum that I have to teach, they they don't come because I'm teaching, they come because when they get sick. So 
most of the time we don't have those patients. And then we start talking about theory and, and imagining things. But here, um, patients are available 24 seven. And this, the, 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 if you don't have a patient in the ward, so you can alternatively, the faculty can, can say, okay, well, you practice on these cyber patient at least for the next while so that, that you know what to do uh, when you come to the clinic. The, the teacher um, is in full control of the learning process and learning environment uh, from distance. So they don't have to be, uh, it, it, it cuts off a lot of administrative um, uh, duties and things like that. And a more frequently, uh, frequent formative assessment with feedback is another dream of a, of, a, of a professor to support their students with less um, efforts um, in more uh, content and more, uh, you know, helpful advices. Um, and as I said, they can do that in two hours in the end of the day, uh, sitting in their office as making a, a cyber patient office hours and, and actually uh, control and assess all their students and give them feedback accordingly. Uh, reduce faculty load. As all, all the things that I have said before, it all reduces the faculty uh, load so that faculty can focus more on the quality of education rather than running around and doing administrative thing and preparing things for, for students. Uh, it reduces faculty stress, certainly. As I said, all these um, factors would reduce and also it improves uh, the, uh, uh, the efficacy of the teaching process. Um, cyber patient also can be benef beneficial to uh, the educational institutions. So what's the dream of the educational institutes? To have a better reputation. So if it, cyber patient would certainly increase, increase the quality of medical education and subsequently the reputation of the organization. And that would trigger more students and the quality in, in increase the quality and quantity of students coming to that medical school. And the most important one that uh, all the deans likes to hear about is reduce the cost of medical education. It would reduce the cost of cyber, uh, uh, a standardized patient, would reduce the cost of um, um, ASCII, would reduce the cost of a lot of other things that, uh, that usually we have. And the cost of uh, the, the, the cyber patient is not more than a textbook. So um, it also have um, a great benefit to healthcare system. Um, the main of that benefit would be reduce costs for hospital system. Hospital systems are looking for a reduction of the cost. And as we all know, medical errors are, are the biggest cost of uh, every uh, organization in America and other places, such as Australia and England and everywhere else. So they, um, you know, knowing better uh, clinical skills, uh, being familiar with the hospital system and decision-making, uh, clinical decision-making in particular, it would increase efficiency of the system. It would um, reduce perhaps medical errors. Errors, we don't have scientific evidence yet, but you would like to uh, look into the research part of it. We're gonna talk next time about it. And it would reduce also the insurance cost. <clears throat> and money, um, uh, when I was big in, in, in uh, uh, simulation, um, uh, I was part of the American College of Surgeons uh, um, uh, simulation committee and also part of the, and I'm still part of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada uh, simulation committee. And um, in, in Washington DC area, um, an insurance company told a group of hospitals that if you put simulation as an integral part of your life in your hospital, we reduce the insurance cost 10%. And that's like millions and millions of dollars. So cyber patient is an online simulation. And I think the hospitals, if we prove that the, 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 the more efficient system, if we prove that it reduces the cost, if it reduces the medical errors, or, or, or organize the, 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 make at least aware, cost aware, the, the, the um, students and faculty and, and doctors, nurses working in the hospital, um, the, the insurance companies would, would love to hear that. And also um, the ultimate benefits of cyber patients, of course, to the whole society. Um, so because from all this cost saving, reduction of errors, 
um, uh, risk management, uh, it, it's all the benefit will go to the whole society. Um, so um, coming to the end of this talk, um, uh, I would like to um, uh, summarize the whole talk into uh, say that um, cyber patient is uh, designed uh, in a curricular format. Whether we're going to conceive it as a curriculum or not, that doesn't matter. It is uh, or designed in a curriculum format. Cyber patient as an additional uh, resource can easily be integrated into the university curriculum for CBL, PBL group discussions, pre-clerkship, clerkship in internship. Cyber patient uh, can be also used as an assessment tool for um, prerequisites like coursework and assignments and so on, uh, as well as formative and summative assessments. And cyber patient um, is and can be beneficial to students, faculty, universities, um, hospitals and healthcare systems and the whole society. Um, at this time, um, I will end my talk and I will be happy to hear from you about your questions. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you, Dr. Kareem. Hi, everybody. So now uh, this is the beginning of the Q&A session. For all attendants that have any questions for Dr. Kareem to be able to discuss or to go over, you can type your questions in the Q&A section or you can also raise your hand. Uh, also, there is, um, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, Aiden. Uh, also, um, I believe um, this is a discussion. So there are uh, universities that already um, implemented cyber patient into their curriculum, integrated in their curriculum. Um, so if anybody in the audience is there who has already um, used cyber patient um, um, into their curriculum and wants to share their experience, also raise please your hands and you're welcome to participate. Perfect. So at the moment right now, we don't have any questions. We're fine right now in terms of questions or comments. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Dr. Kareem, before we finish? Uh, that's what I said. I, I, I would, uh, there, is, there is one question, somebody. Oh, perfect. Now we just got one right now. This is by uh, Mohamed Baraka, and he's asking, how can we use cyber patient in OSCEs? Um, uh, so um, it depends like how your ASCII is designed for. Your ASCII could be designed for um, uh, uh, history taking or physical examination or both, or it could be for any decision making. Um, so yes, you can, um, uh, you can, you can use um, for ASCII practice, as well as uh, for uh, replacing the ASCII. I do not say that we can at this time replace the ASCII because um, I don't have um, evidences yet to say that it is equal to, but we have evidences to say it's, it's equal and better than SPs. So wherever you can use SPs, you can use cyber patient, you can replace it with cyber patient, but but we don't have evidence yet to say it's better. As I said, in Japan, uh, the, the research is done. They are in the process of data analysis, and we will share, we will share that with you uh, as soon as we can. But yes, you can, uh, we can certainly um, use it. And if you want to do any research in, in this regard, then uh, we will support you to do that. Perfect. Uh, we also had uh, Omar Eladil Hanid uh, who raised his hand. So I'm going to allow him to talk. And Omar, you can go ahead and ask your question. I'm going to also unmute you. He's mute. He's mute. I think you need to mute yourself. Unmute, unmute. yourself, actually, Omar. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor Karim. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, please. A little bit louder. Yeah, this is Dr. Omar Al-Adil from uh, Faculty of Medicine International University of Africa. Uh, and uh, in short, I would like to reflect on uh, our faculty experience and uh, 
the curriculum development in our faculty. So people might know how they go about the issue of uh, customization of uh, cyber patients in their curricula. You know, uh, in the Faculty of Medicine International University of Africa, the PISIS model uh, is adopted as educational strategy in curriculum development. And SPICES, as you know, uh, an acronym for the sixth education strategy, uh, uh, mainly student center and uh, integration, interprofessional teaching, and community based uh, education, problem based learning. And because of this, uh, our curricula uh, in the faculty uh, consists of, uh, consist of uh, three phases phase one and phase two are the pre clerkship uh, uh, phases. Especially phase two is called uh, system based, uh, where we have Mr. three, four, five, six, uh, around uh, 22, 18 to 22 weeks per semester, where the whole systems, uh, cardiovascular system, respiratory system, GIT, hematology, nervous system, etc., uh, will be studied in an integrated manner. For instance, uh, uh, in the course of the cardiovascular, uh, the candidate is expected to study the basic sciences. Uh, including anatomy, physiology, and others. And uh, these basic sciences part from prices around 80 to 85 percent of the course. Uh, while the other part, uh, and this is important point to mention here, how people can get uh, integration of uh, the cyber patient in their curricula, or, or how they can get uh, the cyber patient uh, integrated in their curricula, that the other part, which comprises 15 to 20 percent of the courses, objective is to introduce the student as a novice student to the clinical cases, uh, including uh, a history taking and clinical examination from the same patient, presenting, say, for example, the cardiovascular system in uh, disorder in the cardiovascular course, cardiovascular system course. So the intended learning outcomes at that level are firstly to enable the student to practice history and examination in a systemic organized manner and go uh, going from the history to examination and to appreciate what is normal, establish a good rapport and over communication techniques with, with their patients and uh, co-patients and other health team staff in the hospital. And uh, the other issue here also during each course of, of this phase, the students will uh, have common clinical problems, both in problem-based phases. The objective of uh, it is, as you know, problem-based learning, uh, uh, will foster the capability and the ability of the student with some generic team skills and attitudes uh, besides some uh, additional scientific skills, including critical evaluation of the literature and so on. Uh, in the problem-based learning, and this is very important in regards to what is mentioned, uh, there's 120 uh, scenarios of the type of patient. The students have, have work as a group, use from the given scenario, define their own learning objective subsequently, they do some independent uh, self-directed study and then, then back in phase three, going back to the group to discuss and to refine their uh, uh, acquired knowledge and sharing their results. And the last uh, uh, curriculum phase is the clerkship phase, uh, where we have uh, uh, four rotations, four major rotations, clinical shift, internal medicine, general surgery, obesity and gynecology, and the last major shift is pediatric and child health with other minor shifts include psychiatric, uh, special surgery, ENT, of dermatology, ophthalmology, uh, primary health care, uh, not to miss one, uh, and some other uh, uh, minor shifts. So uh, back to cyber patients, I, I do agree that what you have mentioned, cyber patients is very beneficial and uh, really serviceable for all patients, for all health uh, uh, stakeholders, uh, worth mentioning for sure patient safety. Uh, so from this introduction, uh, I would like to share with, with the group uh, of our colleagues here that uh, we started cyber patient uh, and uh, we invited the curricular committee to look into cyber patient and how they can introduce it into the curriculum. Uh, we have uh, really what's called the uh, standing uh, curriculum committee. Uh, they use uh, what is called curriculum map to allow anything to be integrated in the curricula using the expected learning outcomes and the content, uh, going back to student assessment, learning opportunities, and, uh, and the student. So uh, from the pilot which we have, uh, 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 I can conclude uh, three points. 
first of all that our flagship students uh, uh, benefited a lot from the whole level, uh, even level one, two, uh, three. And, uh, uh, and although uh, with some internet difficulty, the, those who uh, practice it, they are not uh, many, but uh, uh, as uh, uh, educational strategy, we look into it and the curricula uh, content. Uh, in regards to the pre clerkship and uh, for sure the, the clerkship student uh, uh, reflection that uh, this fosters uh, uh, their clinical skills and uh, uh, clinical decision making and other stuff. In regards to the pre clerkship uh, novice students, and here I guess uh, the problem will be in, uh, in curriculum uh, which are the schools which adopt uh, mixed spices uh, uh, model. Uh, because uh, here cyber patient uh, has uh, two levels different from each other level one uh, history taking and level two uh, 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 clinical examination so uh, in our system we, 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 we used to have both of them in, in, in the same patient or in, at the same time the other issue, uh, which I, I guess uh, Professor Karim might reflect on it, uh, the depth of uh, or the index of uh, difficulty of each case. But all in all, we see it as an opportunity uh, where the, the, the students uh, will learn a lot of course of their capabilities before going to the hospital, uh, practice and practice and practice. And uh, the whole uh, issues and benefits which people might get out of uh, uh, the issues of simulation, uh, I, I see it uh, very well in, in cyber patients. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank you, uh, Professor Karim, for the opportunity interacting during this dedicated, elegant session, and thanks to all colleagues for listening. Thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Omar. Uh, I, I think it would, uh, I hope you find useful the Dr. Omar's uh, uh, sharing uh, their experience uh, uh, with you all. Uh, now back to, to the questions because there is many questions now on the on the chat and on the sure. question. Yes. So the next uh, comment that we have is from um, Azmatula Adnayakil. He is saying that there are three universities in Afghanistan, Kabul: the Medical University, Herat University, Mazar University, and Arya University that have already added cyber patient into their curriculum. The feedback is amazing and that um, the comment that he has is that professors, students, and deans are very happy. The feedback is 100% positive. The only challenge they have is weak internet cost and the cost, uh, sorry, weak internet speed and the cost of internet for medical school students. Okay. That's a comment. Please go to the next question. Okay, and then the next question that we have is, it was a wonderful session. Which places and new universities have integrated the course? Um, yes, well, I, according to our statistics, um, there is uh, 120 countries that uh, are implementing cyber patient, um, are, are using cyber patient. But, um, as an implementation, we have about 28 uh, universities around the world that we have uh, already signed a contract to implement cyber patient. Uh, uh, into their curriculum or um, uh, to do uh, uh, other research activities with them. Okay, uh, next question we have is by Anna Nalba and she asks, good evening, dear colleagues, is it in plan to include more neurology cyber patients? And thank you in advance for your answer. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, Yes, I'm, I think there, there's enough, uh, I, I think there's about 13 cases or something on neurology, but, um, but yes, we will add um, on neurology, on, on uh, uh, other subjects and other pathologies, um, and we would uh, love to have uh, your feedback and um, uh, guiding us and giving us um, the, 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 the landscape uh, where you are located what are the important pathologies in your area that you would like to see in cyber patient? And we will include those in cyber patient. Um, Aitan's email is uh, there with you. you know, please be in contact with us. Um, this cyber patient is to support students to make it 
to make them uh, a better decision makers. So uh, we will accommodate this um, to the needs of the uh, population, wherever you are. So yes, please be in touch and we will, um, what do you have specific in mind in neurology to be added to cyber patient? And we, all, we will add that for sure. Next. Okay, and then next we have is Gahala El Tahir, and she asks in OSCEs, can we be very specific, for example, to say to the student, examine this breast lump and give findings? Um, uh, you, there is, um, uh, there are specific cases for each of those specific cases. Yes, you can, um, but if you want uh, a specific case. Uh, like uh, uh, a, a cancer or a lump uh, in, in the breast, um, we can always make those cases. So for example, actually breast cases are the next thing uh, coming. So um, uh, yeah, anything that you, if you have a rectal examination, a breast examination, uh, we have the whole uh, uh, book uh, on Bates. You know, the Bates is all incorporated in uh, the cyber patient. So anything you can find in Bates, you can find in cyber patient if it relates to that particular pathology. So it's not, cyber patient is not designed at, the, at this time to replace OSCEs so that, um, that we can have specific cases for OSCEs, but you can use cyber patient as you can use any SPs or any, um, uh, any patient uh, for for uh, this type of uh, uh, you know uh, structured uh, clinical examination. Okay, uh, next question we have is by Noshafarin, and she asks, which skills should we have for beneficial use from this app? Which skills? Uh, I think. Um, uh, most clinical skills, not all, but most clinical skills um, would be um, useful, um, partic in particular, the history taking, physical examination, uh, decision making, um, differential diagnosis, uh, um, uh, daily management, uh, recommendations, uh, surgery. Uh, those are all the skills that you will uh, um, find useful uh, using cyber patient. Uh, having said that, um, uh, there are certain other skills that is not uh, part of um, this um, uh, basic uh, cyber patient. And as I mentioned, we're going to include those into the next generation of cyber patient, which is cyber patient for EPAs. Um, and that would include um, the uh, communication skills uh, that will include communication with patient, communication with, with, um, with the family of the patient, communication with the team, communication with your superiors, um, how to present um, uh, skills, uh, to present um, uh, your, your errors or your mistakes or, or system-based mistakes um, through uh, m and rounds, um, how to um, uh, do handover. So those kind of skills uh, will be all the 12 EPA skills and trustable professional uh, activity skills would be part of the new cyber patient that's coming. Okay, great. Now the next question we have is by Susan. She's asking, is there a literature of how cyber patient improve clinical decision making? She actually has uh, multiple questions. Do you normalize certain number of integrated cases with credit hours of a course for a three credit course, practicum or theory? How many cases would be enough to consider? Um, so let me ask your, your, your um, second question first. Um, we don't um, uh, tell people how many cases you should take for, um, we don't normalize it for specific courses because um, the courses are designed by universities. The, your curriculum is designed by your university and you are the one who should make uh, the differentiation of how many cases, which cases would be good for, um, for the, to give credit to a student for a particular subject. 
like let's say if it's a it's a surgical rotation what are those cases that you choose if it is a, a, a neurology if it's an OBGYN rotation so you have to make that decision or somebody in your university has to make that decision so we don't make that decision we provide this and consider this as a huge electronic book for for an interactive electronic book online for uh, for you to use to enrich your 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 curriculum and learning environment so uh, we don't actually uh, stratify um, uh, because we think in every university people have their own mind on how to um, what quality what quantity uh, of patient has to be part of a credit or two credits or three credits so um, about but the your the first part of your question um, is there literature yes there is a literature um, next week, uh, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, research and evidence behind cyber patient. We just um, uh, about to publish um, a research uh, uh, project in the creative, the Journal of Creative Education, um, and that looks at the comparison of the SPs versus cyber patient. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about it now because it's the, it's the subject of the next lecture but I hope you're gonna be in the next lecture to talk, to talk to you about. Also, we have research on other things like comparison of textbook to uh, uh, cyber patient to textbook, comparison of cyber patient to, um, to uh, physical, in physical examination, um, uh, learning from book and from cyber patient. We also have um, uh, now uh, a survey, uh, a complete survey of about a cohort of 60 students from Kazan State Medical University um, uh, where they implemented cyber patient for the whole semester. And we have a survey of students, how do they think about cyber patient? And I can present all this in the next lecture for you. Okay, great. Well, that's all of our questions for today's session. I want to thank everybody for being a part of this webinar. It was very insightful. Now, as Dr. Kareem has mentioned, our last session of our four-part session series is on Thursday, July 2nd at 8 a.m. Pacific time. It is called Cyber Patient Research, Types of Research Activities, Completed Projects, Research in Progress, and Research Opportunities. Uh, you can register via email. We'll be sending email outs to all of our attendees. And uh, that will be all for today. Thank you very much for coming. Bye now. Thank you.